Exploring the Mind, Sickness and Memory, How the Immune System Changes the Brain, in partnership with the U of M Department of Psychology. So, um, my name's Natalie. I work on um, memory and how memory is formed. And I became interested in this by accident because I was working, I was talking to one of the professors in my, as an undergraduate and ended up working with him in his lab and sort of never stopped doing that. But more recently, I've become interested in how the immune system affects the brain and in particular how it affects memory processes. And that's, that's not necessarily an obvious link. Why would we start thinking about the immune system and the brain together? But it turns out that more and more, the more we learn about the immune system and the more we learn about the brain, that, the, the, that we realize there's this great interconnectedness between them. And so some of the th reasons that we think the uh, immune modulation of memory is important are for diseases like Alzheimer's disease. We know that inflammation is a part of the disease process, that it's, you have more, people with Alzheimer's have more inflammation in the brain. But more recently, there's also data suggesting that things like long-term chronic illnesses, heart disease, or even gum disease, these chronic inflammation states, um, might be risk factors, probably not causal, but risk factors for de developing Alzheimer's disease. So I started to look at this question, um, and uh, it's one of those fields that is a joy and terrifying every day because there's too much information and I'd, none of us know very much about it, but today I want to introduce this topic. So before I get started, I want to tell you about the people who actually do the work in the lab. And I'm going to be talking about work from a graduate student, Daria Chesilova, for the most part, um, as well as uh, Caitlin Basilico. And then I have other graduate students and former graduate students, undergraduates, and people who have since left the lab who've worked on this project as well. So to start off, I want to just have you think about this question. How do you feel when you feel sick? Sleepy, okay, we're tired when we're sick. What else? Slower, lethargic. Oh yeah, cranky, sometimes we cry more, yeah. Nauseous, sometimes we'll have a fever as well. So there's a whole list of sickness, uh, symptoms. Often there's achiness that goes along with sickness, fever. You don't want to do things that you normally enjoy because you're tired and achy and cranky, um, more emotional, antisocial, and sluggish thoughts, both uh, thoughts and physically. So this turns out to be really in important for how we started thinking about the Im immune system and the brain interacting. And the reason for that is because at some point, someone decided to compare this to the list of symptoms of depression which look a lot the same. Tiredness, increased or decreased sleep, achiness sometimes, not really a fever so much here, don't, not wanting to do fun things, um, more emotional, sad, feeling hopeless, antisocial, um, and often distracted, poorer memory, not able to focus. So I'm not gonna be talking about depression tonight, but I wanna bring it up because this was really the very beginning of people really starting to take seriously the idea that the immune system in the brain was really important for normal cognitive processes and also disease processes in the brain. So the immune system must somehow be communicating with the brain in order to tr trigger these behaviors and thoughts and feelings. And so this question can also be applied to memory processes. And so the question of how does the immune system con uh, communicate with the brain? And what we're thinking about a lot in the lab at the moment is what are the long-lasting consequences of a serious illness on memory and cognition? So the brain. We don't usually think about the immune system when we're talking about the brain. We usually think of something that looks like this. This is a fixed brain. Usually in real life, it's pinker and jigglier. Um, and I work on mice whose brains are a little bit smaller than the rat brain. But the nice thing about working on animal models is that we can look at mechanisms in a system that's a lot smaller, a little bit simpler, but has a lot of the same kinds of pathways and does a lot of the same kinds of biological functions, including memory. 
And when we think about the brain, we usually think about these cells. These are neurons. And this is a picture, I'll show a few of his tonight, from Ramon y Cajal, who did these beautiful stains and then did these hand-drawn um, pictures that we still use a lot today. So we know that neurons are, well, we think of neurons as the primary computational unit in the brain, or circuits. Um, and we've thought for a long time, or the field has thought for a long time, as the brain is somehow isolated from the body. Well, sort of isolated from the body. The brain takes in a lot of information from the world and the body, including sensory information, vision, touch, uh, temperature. Um, we also have a lot of communication between the peripheral systems and the brain in terms of stress and hormone, hormones. So it's not so isolated from the body, it turns out. But this idea that the brain was still isolated from the immune system persisted well into the 1980s. This idea of an immunoprivileged system comes from a couple of really important facts. First of all, there's a blood-brain barrier that prevents anything really nice, nasty from getting from the blood into the brain. And this is hugely protective and hugely important. Sort of like the skin that stops a lot of nasty things from getting into our bloodstream, we have an extra layer going into the brain. Another thing about the, brain, the immune system responses in the brain is that they're really slow. In the periphery, if you get sick, you have an immune response really quickly. Some you pick up some bacteria, you, you pick up a virus, you have a very good, rapid immune response. And this is really important, otherwise the bacteria or virus can take hold and you can get very sick. And the third thing is that the machinery for, for developing antibodies, which is one of the things we think of as pretty key for the immune system, is extremely low in the brain. So all of these things led scientists for many, many decades to sort of have the, this idea that we had the brain and we had the immune system, and these two things did not communicate. And this turns out to be wrong. So these facts are not wrong. The facts are correct, but the theory is wrong. And it turns out there's a lot of interaction between the immune system and the brain, both during illness and during normal periods of time. Not only is there interactions between the immune system and the brain, there are specialized immune cells that live in the brain. And so here, these darker cells here are astrocytes. They're kind of a neuroimmune cell, and they're there wrapping around these pale gray cells, which are neurons. And this interaction between neuroimmune cells and uh, neurons, this is another picture of, from Cajal, where they've been known about for a long time, but the precise roles of what these cells do is not known, or has not been known. The, another type of cell is microglia, and these are kind of cool because they're small, hence micro, um, and when they're in a normal state doing their normal thing, making sure nothing bad is in the brain, then they look like this. They look fluffy, they have lots of processes reaching out. But if there's an infection or if there's damage, then they change shape pretty rapidly and become these, uh, they call them amoeboid shape, blobby shapes that can go and capture uh, any invaders or cell debris. So what immune cells do in terms of their immune-like function is that they can become activated during injury or infection and they eat or, or um, fight for our bodies or injured cells and they also produce immune signaling molecules. Now, has everybody heard of inflammation? Maybe in headlines like this, reduce inflammation with comfort and eating cleans, or anti-inflammatory diet, or the 13 most anti-inflammatory foods. This idea that we have to reduce inflammation is pretty prevalent right now. It's one of these key things. Inflammation is bad, and reducing inflammation is healthy. It's not entirely true. Inflammation is important. It helps heal wounds. It's that first, one of the first layers of defense against invaders. Um, but here, weight gain, because they're talking about food, it can lead to weight gain, disease, maybe Alzheimer's disease as well. But in addition to these immune roles in the brain, it's becoming more and more clear that neuroimmune cells also have really important roles in normal brain function. And these include shuttling energy from the blood vessels that go through the brain to neurons, so neurons can do their job. They can also modify the function of neurons themselves and change that computational work that neurons are doing. And they can even connect, change connections between neurons. 
And some of the things that neuroimmune, the neuroimmune system and neuroimmune cells have become implicated is really important for are things like sleep, or lack thereof, um, emotional regulation. And this is not during depression, but just as a normal, a normal daily lives. Stress. The stress system and the neuroimmune system are also highly intertwined and can both exaggerate each other and suppress each other. And of course, memory. So how does neuroimmune signaling control memory processes? Well, in order to, to talk about this, we need to talk a little bit more about memory. When we think of memory in our everyday lives, we're usually thinking about those visual scenes that we recall from our lives, whether it's what you had for breakfast this morning, or whether it's what you did last year at this time during the last big snowstorm. But when we're using animal models, we can't ask the animals what they remember. We can't ask them to write a test to test what they remember from what they learned the next day. But the important part about memory, all memories, is that it changes your behavior. It changes your behavior so you can act appropriately in, uh, in accordance with what you've learned before. And in animals, we've gotten very good at measuring changes in behavior. So one example of this is spatial memory. And this is a scene for a human task that's done in the lab where people are given a virtual reality involvement, uh, in, uh, environment and placed in a virtual pool of water. So your task in this is to find the escape route or find something that's hidden in this pool. Now, the first time you do this, you'll probably be like, I don't know, I'm just going to navigate my way around this pool and figure out how these controls work. And eventually, you'll probably run into whatever it is you're supposed to find. And then, if you're told to do it again, you'll be much faster at finding that this escape route is somewhere along this flat wall, or roughly halfway between this tree and this yellow sign. So you've learned something. Your behavior has changed. You've gotten faster at learning it. And this task, unlike some of the tasks we use, is directly adapted from some, uh, a task we use in rodents. We call it the Morris water maze after the, the scientist, Richard Morris, who first published on the, on the maze. And here, it's exactly the same task. They're placed in a pool of water. There's a platform somewhere around here. If we can't tell them what to do. We just place them in the water and they swim until they find the platform. Now, rats and mice swim really well, but they'd really prefer not to be. So they're pretty happy to find the platform and they learn about where it is very, very effectively. So after they've swum around the pool and found this platform a number of times, before they've, on the first time, what they do is something like this. They're just everywhere. They're just searching for wherever, where, well, searching the pool wherever they can swim. But after they've done this a bunch of times, they're much more localized at searching in the area where they know the platform should be. This is exactly the same type of um, memory as humans show when we're learning about a spatial water maze or learning how to get from the Ann Arbor Library to Zingerman's for dinner. And it uses exactly the same neural circuits and processes as well. Oh, we think we, as far as we can tell in humans. But how does the brain store this information? How does memory work? Well, we know that neurons connect to each other in circuits. And many of these are basic circuits are, 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 are developed throughout the lifespan. This, again, is a picture of Cajal's. This is the hippocampus. It's one of the regions that we think of as really, really important for memory formation. And this is also the hippocampus, but with a much more modern transgenic rainbow labeling technique used. And you can see that the, cis, the circuit is the same, this like mouth-like uh, structure is here. And you have these cell bodies that are blobby with these long projections down. What happens in these circuits is that, that neurons form new connections and change the strength of connections in order to encode memory. So here, going back to this neuron, you may be able to see some fuzziness in the, in the drawing. This isn't a trick of your eyes, and it's not because the pen was bleeding. It's because Cajal drew these little spikes off these 
parts of the neuron. So this is the input side of the neuron, or dendrites, and we call these spines. And what these spines do is that they're the ones that make connections with other neurons. And it makes connections at places called synapses. So here, this is one of those projections from that one of those little spines. And this is another neuron that's going to shoot information, to bring information. So before learning, a synapse might look like this. This neuron fires. It causes a release of chemicals or neurotransmitters into the synapse. These neurotransmitters bind to specific receptors. It's binding, they're binding to the green ones here. And you might get some small response in this, this, this postsynaptic, this second neuron, neuron two. But after that connection has been activated together a few times, we see changes at the synapse. The synapse gets bigger. And there are more of these green receptors here. So that when this neuron fires and releases neurotransmitter, now we have a much bigger response of this neuron. So that's formed a new connection in the brain. And we think about that changes in synapses as how memories are formed. So I said I was talking about the immune system and memory. So what about the immune system? What's it doing here? <coughs> now, typically, we draw synapses exactly like this, with neuron one here and neuron one two there, neuron two there, and then we ignore anything else happening around the brain. But actually, there are other cells and astrocytes and microglia, and these do interact at neurons and at synapses. And astrocytes have very recently become one of those hot topics that people are very excited to study with some new tools in neuroscience that allow us to manipulate them. And what people have found is that these astrocyte processes wrap around the synapse. So if you have that kind of close interaction, it seems likely that they're doing something really important. So one possibility is that they're just bringing energy to the synapse. These changes during learning are highly energy demanding. So maybe that that's what the astrocyte is doing. But we know a couple of other things. We know that one of the things that astrocytes can do is take up some of this neurotransmitter. So it can control that communication between those two neurons too. Another thing that astrocytes do is that they release those same immune signaling molecules that in the body causes inflammation. And they can communicate with other astrocytes as well as microglia, but also with neurons. And at low levels, those cytokines aren't causing inflammation at all. They're not reacting to some disease process. They're really, really important for allowing these plasticity processes, these changes in synapses to take place. And we can disrupt memory by activating astrocytes and the immune system in general. So this is a study not from my lab. This is a study from a couple of years ago now where they injected uh, a viral mimic. So it's not a virus. The animal doesn't get sick. But it's a very similar kind of molecule to what exists uh, when, when a virus invades your body. And so it triggers the same kind of immune response. And so this is not spatial learning. This is fear conditioning. And here, we place animals into a box. We allow them to explore for a few minutes. And then they get a mild foot sh shock. It doesn't cause any damage. They're fine, but they don't like it. We use the same kind of system in humans as well. They're very effective for learning for all animals. So during training, animals are not showing any fear responses. That's normal, too. But the next day, when we place them back into that same box, now they show what we call a freezing response. And this is a crouched, immobile posture. It's a defensive posture. If you think about the term scared stiff, that's what these animals are doing. And we use this change in behavior, this increase in fear behaviors, as a measure of how well the animals learned, how much memory the animals have. So these are our animals that are not treated at all. They're just given a vehicle injection of saline. It's inert. And they learn just fine. But if we compare that to animals that receive this viral mimic immediately after training, now we see that these animals don't show very much freezing of the freezing response the next day at all. And that suggests, along with some other experiments that I won't describe today, that these activation of the neuroimmune system can actually impair memory formation. 
Some recent data from our own, work, own lab, and this is uh, my student, my graduate student, Caitlin Basilico, um, has shown that we can replicate this effect, but instead of injecting the viral mimic into the periphery, into the body, we can inject it straight into the brain. And we get a small decrease in memory here. This is a fairly low dose, um, but that's always nice to know that we can replicate standard effects. So I mentioned earlier that what, I'm really, what we're really interested in asking is how does previous sickness, how does some event that's happened much earlier in your life increase the risk for memory decline or change memory processes in general? And this work that I'm going to talk about here is from my, another, one of my graduate students, Daria Chesilova, who's about to defend, I hope, in a few months. So here we use the same strategy of injecting um, a drug that mimics either, the vi either a viral infection or a small component of the uh, bacterial membrane that triggers a similar um, and very strong immune response. Instead of it doing one injection around the time they're learning something, they got five injections over a two-week period. So these were spaced uh, three days apart. They got five injections. The animals got a little bit sick. They, start, they had a, saw a small drop in weight that they then regained back after a couple of days, but overall were fine. Um, and after the end of the injections, they recovered very well. And then we waited, and we waited and we waited, and eight weeks later, which doesn't sound like that long in our lifetime, especially when you have a deadline looming, but in the life of a mouse or in the life of a graduate student, this is a really, really long time. So eight weeks later, we did our learning and memory tests. And I didn't know what to expect. I had hopes, but I wasn't entirely sure anything was going to come out. And so in males, what we found was this is the context fear conditioning test again. We have this strong levels of freezing during the test, showing that these animals that just received the saline injection in that two-week period could learn the task very well. And when we had this bacterial pro, um, component, LPS, the, they, they showed no disruption. But when we used the viral mimic, we saw a pretty strong impairment of memory. And we've replicated this a couple of times in our own lab. What was almost more surprising is that we also tested this in females um, and saw no impairments at all. Now, in some ways, that we, that we see sex differences in any of the tasks that we do is sometimes surprising and sometimes not. We expect to see some. We don't expect to see sex differences in everything we do. But this one is particularly intriguing to me because we know that women are particularly vulnerable to some of the kinds of memory decline that we're thinking about when we're thinking about inflammation. And that includes Alzheimer's disease. Women are twice as likely to develop Alzheimer's disease than men. On the other hand, women are much more are uh, likely to recover well and recover rapidly from traumatic brain injury or con concussion. And so we don't know which process is going to be dominant here, or if it's something else entirely. So this led to a couple of other questions. And one was that, well, we see these deficits when animals are learning about fear-related information. But is this that just about fear? Are they impaired, are males impaired across many different types of memory? What about females? Are females protected across many different types of memory, or do they show learning of some kinds of information and not of others? So we tested a second type of memory. Now, this one is a little bit specific to rodents, but I'm sure we can think of parallels in our own life. Mice and rats are really curious. They like to explore new things as long as they're not like, looming and dangerous. So we put them in a box with a couple of identical toys. So these are sharks, not baby sharks, just sharks. And we allow them to explore the, these two identical toys for a couple of minutes. We, let, we do this about twice in a single day. And then the next day, we put them back in the box. But now they have one toy that's the same as they've seen before and one different toy. So if mice remember what they've seen before, then what they're going to do is go and spend more time exploring the new object. They're curious, it's a new toy, what's not to like? If they don't remember, they'll usually show about equal times exploring each. So 
when we test this, this is looking at how much time they're spending at the novel object, the pirate ship. And in males, what we see is that saline treated animals, a paradigm works, they learn this task, they can retrieve their memory, they like to explore the pirate ship. Um, but in both of the immune activation animals, both the bacterial and, and viral mimics, we now see impairments in this kind of memory. So what about females? Now females look the same as males. They can learn the task just fine, but eight weeks after this um, bacterial or viral-like um, immune challenge, they now show impairments of memory. So I was really happy about this, especially the third time that my student did it, to show it to, I was finally convinced that it was a real effect, um, but also a little bit confused. We know a lot about what, what immune activation does when that memory process is happening. We don't know a lot about the long-lasting effects of immune challenges on memory. That's why it's exciting, but also challenging. So the question for us is what causes this? What's changing in the brain and cha or changing in the immune system to really prevent these memories from being formed properly? And what's different in males and females to allow females to be protected against some of these memory impairments? And the short answer to this is we still have no idea. We have a lot of data. We're still trying to figure it out. There are changes, but how and what they're doing, we don't know yet. But I can tell you one thing that it's not. And this turns out to be really important. It is not the case that these animals just have persistent immune activation in the brain. If it was, that would be great. We could go and test that. We could find out why they had long-lasting activation. Um, but for better or worse, that's not what's happening. And we tested this by looking at these microglial cells. So I mentioned earlier that these microglial cells used in a healthy brain, in a healthy um, uh, scenario, they are fluffy looking. They have lots of different processes. And when, the, when there's an immune challenge happen or sickness going on, then they become these sort of blobby, they become retracted and bulkier. And so, and we, you also see more of them. So we counted the number and looked at the shapes of microglial cells in the hippocampus lo across lots and lots of animals. And what we saw, this is a saline treated animal, this is a poly IC treated animal. There's no differences. So you can see these really nice cell bodies and these long projections that are coming out here. And you can see the same thing in both treatment groups. So this tells us that unlike some previous experiments that have used a much bigger immune challenge, more like sepsis, say, that have seen this persistent immune activation in the brain, the challenge that we're using is long enough to change the brain, but not, long enough, not big enough to cause this persistent inflammation. So we know it's not that, and we're still working on other possibilities. But for now, I want to talk a little bit about what these results mean. So first of all, sickness or neuroimmune activation has very long lasting effects on brain function. Now this is important. All of us have been sick in our life. All of us, or probably all of us, have had some other kind of immune activation, whether it's allergies, whether it's uh, a vaccination, We've all had some exposure to these Im uh, immune system activators. Does that mean that we should be worried about our memory function? No, probably not. And the reason for that is that these mice are kept in cages. They have a very impoverished sort of world that they live in, which is really useful for trying to understand exactly what causes memory. But the kind of enriched environment that we have, where we go out in the world and we travel to work and we come to the library and we listen to lectures, provides a lot of protection against memory impairments as well. Another point that this data tells us is that males and females are differently vulnerable to the impact of immune activation on memory. And although our data shows that maybe males are a little bit more vulnerable, I think that really what we're going to see, and given other data that's in the literature, is that males and females are vulnerable to different kinds of immune insults 
and, and different processes in the brain are vulnerable to these insults. It's not that one sex is inherently more delicate than the other, it's that they have different processes going on. And third, this is coming back to this question. I had the flu a few weeks ago. Does that mean my memory is damaged forever? Should I worry about the risk of memory decline? Unless you've had a really serious illness, in which case you're probably worried about a lot more than just your memory, you're probably fine. The other takeaway point is, does this mean that I should take anti-inflammatory foods to improve my memory? And I've been thinking about this a lot recently because this study came out last week. And there's been a lot of press about it. I don't know if anyone's seen this. But it's basically saying that turmeric su supplements, curcumin is the active uh, compound in turmeric. It's a really powerful anti-inflammatory. Um, and they're showing that in aging populations that this might help improve memory and prevent memory decline. So should we all be taking this to improve our memory? Again, probably not. This data is very exciting, but it's on a very few people and it's one study. I'm not sure that many of us would benefit that much from, from this particular intervention. But the best thing for inflammation is living a healthy lifestyle. Exercise, healthy diet, maybe some supplements. Maybe those things can help protect us in the long term. So I don't have any big hopeful message about how to protect your memory from the effects of inflammation. I can't even really tell you what's going on. All I can tell you is that it's there, it's important, and we're going to figure it out. <laughs> so thank you. And again, this is Daria and Caitlin who did the work I talked about here. And we have plenty of time for questions. So there's a microphone for you. Okay. <laughs> Is it? Oh, that's a good question. So the work that we did used um, either sickness during memory formation or sickness weeks before the memory formation. So the question was, what happens if you have a memory and then sometime later you get really sick? What happens to that established memory? So there's something um, really cool about how memories are stored in the brain, and that is memories that are just stored are really vulnerable to disruption both immediately, soon afterwards, after retrieval. But if you wait a little while, weeks, months, years, those memories become really, really stable. And so we've looked a little bit to see if we see general memory disruption of, of tasks that are learned before the sickness are disrupted. We don't see any. We haven't looked very hard. But I would suspect that those older memories are pretty stable and pretty safe from disruption. Oh, that's a good question. So there are other neuroimmune cell cells in the brain. Um, they don't have as much of an immune function, but one of them are oligodendrocytes that form that myelin sheath around neurons. Um, one of the links, one of the really important links for a lot of what we know about inflammation in the brain is studying multiple sclerosis, where inflammation actually targets that myelin sheath and breaks it down. So the microglia um, are different from those, those cells that develop the sheath but also neuroimmune cells. That's a good question. It does. Um, I'm not sure how. Um, um, 
yeah, unfortunately, I'm not a virologist, so, <laughs> so I don't have a good answer for that. But it does get through the blood-brain barrier either. So there are ways that the blood-brain barrier becomes open. One of those is during sickness. So if you're really sick, you do have more leakiness in that blood-brain barrier. Um, Another way is that some things are actively transported across the blood-brain barrier. So one possibility, and I don't know for sure, is that that virus mimics some other molecule that's in the body that will get actively transported into the brain. And viruses are nasty like that, so it's possible. Up in the back corner first. Uh, yeah, so um, you mentioned that humans probably have uh, more protection against memory loss because we move around a lot and have more robust lives. Yes. Um, are there differential studies with mice um, to see if they have the same sort of memory protection? Yes. So if you um, uh, rear animals in a very enriched environment with toys and running wheels and other animals and bigger spaces and you switch out those toys, they have better memory, they learn faster. There's not so much done on how easily disrupted it is. Um, and that would be a really interesting question. But certainly those memories are much more robust and they're much smarter, probably happier animals too. Yeah. Yeah. Memories later. So they have. So the, the amazing thing about children is how resilient they are. And the, most, the people that are most vulnerable to sickness and memory decline are aging pe uh, people who are aging. Um, and as you go back from that, the less impact it has. Now, a child who, will, who is sick will have impairments in memory at that time point, but the ability of the brain to rebound and recover and to redevelop that plasticity seems to be very much intact. Now, there are other studies in not so much memory related in children that are really interesting that speak to this idea of um, the importance of the immune system in controlling behaviors. Um, and there's a syndrome called PANDAS, and I can't remember exactly what the acronym stands for, but it's children who've had a strep infection, and this is a very small number of these, these of children who have strep. Um, during that infection, they will develop OCD-like and anxiety-like behaviors that go away when the infection is treated and recur again if they have another infection. So there's something, uh, and that seems to be more about the immune activation than the infection itself. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's a really good question too. So what we know about the immune, uh, neuroimmune signaling and function and post-traumatic stress disorder is that for many patients with post-traumatic stress disorder, they have elevated levels of circulating inflammatory markers. That's pretty much what we know. Um, inflammation markers. Um, so that's pretty much all we know. So there, there's, there's an, and in fact, for a little bit of backstory, that's how I got into starting to think about inflammation in the brain as well. I was thinking about stress and, and fear and the relationship to um, for the importance of those, that relationship for developing post-traumatic stress disorder. And because of this literature on immune activation and um, post-traumatic stress disorder, I was like, oh, we should look at this to see if an immune event, prior immune event, can enhance fear memories and have these really strong fear memories. And we see that a little bit, but we see a much stronger memory deficit later on. So that's what our lab has shifted to focusing on. Um, there's also an interesting relationship between, and very complicated relationship between stress um, and immune activation. And so who's ever had you know, prednisone or taken Flonase or any of these kinds of things? Um, those drugs are to suppress your immune system, right? They're to, to decrease inflammation. And yet stress also increases inflammatory signaling and immune, <laughs> and immune activation, some kinds of immune activation um, in the body. So there's this really complicated relationship between those two things. So in post-traumatic stress disorder, it's possible that immune activation in the brain is mediating some of the stress effects, causing those anxiety and fear memories, um, or the reverse might also be true, but we don't know. It's a long way of saying we don't know. So when you say memory, prospective memory. Um, 
would happen sickness, then that is your trust person past memory. Would that help that person today? That's a good question. Um, not we haven't done anything retrospective. Effectively, um, it would have to be a very severe illness, I think. Um, probably not a recommended course of action. But in look, one of the goals for looking at some of these pathways is to think about how do we manipulate memory? And that sounds a little bit sci-fi-ish, right? How do we get in there and mess with it? But, but it might be helpful for thinking about if there are some immune-related pathways that really specifically disrupt memory, maybe those will be useful tools for treating post-traumatic stress disorder memories. And the reverse is also true. If there are some in neuroimmune pathways that can strengthen memory formation or support memory formation, and we know that there are just at really low doses and they're hard to manipulate, but maybe so there are some others that would work better, maybe those can be used for cognitive enhancers and memory enhancers in disease states. Mm -hmm. What's the objective of looking at this from the point of view of perhaps this is a natural thing for the body to do if you get sick or have an experience and to get rid of those memories to protect them from the Right. So I think, I think that's a really good question. What is the goal of studying this? Maybe this is an, a normal process, and I, I think it is. I think that a lot of the things that happen when you're sick, that tiredness and that lethargy, that antisocialness, they're to protect you and other animals in your community from getting sick or for, and, and to protect you so that you can rest up and allow the immune system to do its job. So being sick, that immune activation is incredibly energy demanding. And memory processes are also energy demanding. So if you a sick, you, you don't want to waste time remembering where food was, right? Why bother remembering where food was when you have to fight off the illness or die? Um, and so I think there is that, that uh, normal processing involved. But I think there's another way to think about that as well. We often think about either, I mean, we do this in our research as well, um, we either disrupting memory or not. We're disrupting all memories or we're disrupting none of them. And that's not what we see, at least in our work. We sometimes see disruption of one memory process and not another. And we know that a lot of these memory types depend on slightly different circuits and different brain regions. And so there might be a way in which sometimes sickness is shifting from one kind of information to a different system, whether that's more efficient or I don't know what. I'm not entirely sure why. But, but the idea about this, partly to cure disease, but also, you know, if I'm talking to NIH, then absolutely, for, uh, it's, it's to cure disease. If I'm talking to NSF, and if I'm really honest, I'm a nerd. I like to know how things work. <laughs> and it's there. It's probably doing something. I want to know the answer to it. So that's really the goal, figuring out how it works. How does, sorry, what's? Appetite and smell. Those are great questions, and certainly um, sickness and immune activation has a really important role in regulating what we eat, what is appetizing, what um, if you've been sick and eaten something, then you're probably not going to eat it again. Um, I haven't looked at any of those, and I'm not so familiar with that literature on the uh, how those systems are interacted. But I know they're important, but I don't. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, exactly. And that's sort of one of these, these reasons that we're starting to think about this not as immune activation impairs memory, but as immune activation might disrupt some forms of memory that aren't so relevant when you're sick. But if they are relevant, like the food you eat, then that's something that's going to be enhanced some way. So that's that idea of shifting between information systems. Other questions? OK. Oh, yeah. Chris, I was just curious. Um, you mentioned at least two different types of uh, memory tests. Mm -hmm. um,
how many are there that you're looking forward to uh, doing this type of work on? Um, we use we use three or four routinely in the lab. One of them that we've started using more, and it's a really old test, and I have been mocked by one of my colleagues for using it, but it's great. It it, it, it um, uses this competition between different kinds of information systems. And so then we can look to see if one of them is preferentially disrupted. Um, but there are more memory tests than I can, in, for mice, than I can count off the top of my head. Um, we use a lot of tests that involve fear and stress, because we're the doom and gloom lab. But, um, but there are also a lot of tests that, that many of our, my colleagues use that look at um, a pet it food related learning, a spatial learning, um, yeah, so many, many tests, but we're not going to do them all because none of my grad students have that kind of time. Mm-hmm. That's a good question. So the idea of cognitive reserve is that if you have, if, you, if you're a mouse, I'm going to talk about this in mice, but this works equally well for, for, for humans. If you're somebody who has been healthy all your life, you have, you're well-educated or busy or read lots of books, then you're going to have quite a lot of cognitive reserve. If you've had a lot of stressors, um, uh, disease, then, then that's going to drive down the, the cognitive deserve, reserve. But the idea is what happens at that next hit? What happens when you, with that next illness? Somebody who has, um, who, who is very robust cognitively, physically, are going to just have more resilience to the next hit. And I don't think that's in competition with this in any way. I think that those, that, that, um, if we looked for that, we would, we would certainly start to see that if we had animals that had environment, environmental enrichment or something grow, growing up, we would be able to see more protection against some of these effects. So I think these two things don't go together. I certainly don't think it's one or the other. But in terms of risk factors, you can think about this as one of those things that might decrease how much cognitive reserve or general health, health points is not really what I'm going for here, but um, that might, might start to cause that decline and make somebody more vulnerable to that next hit. Right. So in humans, I think there's probably two processes going on with this. All of us, when we're sick, particularly if we're severely ill, will show impairments in memory and cognitive impairments during that period of time. In younger, healthy people, for the most part, people recover afterwards and don't show that memory decline. In, in, in elderly patients, there tends to be either some recovery and then a decline or just no recovery at all. Um, but in patients that sort of are in between those two populations, and often here we're talking about heart disease patients, patients of heart attack um, that are happening more, more like midlife, people often report um, with heart attack or bypass surgery that they have brain fog soon after. And you'd expect that this is a major surgery that people undergo, um, and it's a huge recovery. But the other thing that people report is cognitive decline that seems to kick in several mo like months later. Um, in humans, that's, that specific time course is harder to point, point uh, sort of pin down because there's so much individual variation. Um, and I expect that time course to be a little bit longer than in mice, who are relatively short-lived. Um, so months to years in humans and weeks to 
um, certain rodents. We're not talking. We're not talking decades. Not yet. Not yet. That would be too much of a leap, even for me. <laughs> but we might look at that. Yeah, Heather. Oh, what about pregnancy? So there are a lot of immune changes um, at various different points in life, during adolescence, during pregnancy, during, um, and during aging. Um, and so there are, there's, this, there's a standard thing that during pregnancy, women's memory gets worse, at least short-term memory. Long-term memory doesn't seem to be affected so much. Um, one of the really interesting questions is what happens afterwards. And so in women that have had multiple children, given birth to multiple children, um, there's a, a number of studies that show an increased risk of Alzheimer's disease. Whether that number is two or five is less clear, but, um, but there, there, is, there, there does seem to be some link there. And it's not just the number of children in the household. It doesn't, not an effect on men. Um, why? We don't know. But there's also data uh, not looking at immune changes, but um, just looking at pregnancy and changes in the brain after that show there are actually changes in memory systems that are engaged long after multiple pregnancies, at least in rodents. Mileage may vary. But there's probably a role for immune, immune activation in this in the brain. Um, the immune system, one of the many things I didn't talk about was the immune system is really important during development of the brain as well. And if you have that kind of plasticity going on that happens during pregnancy, then that's probably an important factor as well. So yes, it's important. No idea how. Yeah. Hey, yeah. Um, So it wasn't. It was sickness mimicking the the symptoms of depression. Um, but during depression, people do report having impaired cognition and less good memory, at least for positive things. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. This program was recorded on January twenty eighth, two thousand and nineteen, at the Ann Arbor District Library.